Hi, uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'd like to welcome you to uh, Citrus uh, Research Exchange. Uh, I am Ming Wu. I am the uh, chief scientist uh, uh, of uh, Citrus at Berkeley. I'm also a uh, professor at uh, electrical engineering and computer sciences uh, here at Berkeley. And uh, uh, I'd like to uh, welcome you to this research exchange. I'd also like to acknowledge uh, the uh, support of Infineon Technologies, uh, which uh, uh, supported uh, the uh, lunches uh, you're enjoying now. And uh, I'd also like to uh, welcome uh, the viewers uh, from webcast. This research exchange is uh, webcasted uh, in real time. Uh, there are many viewers uh, following our research exchange, uh, as well as uh, uh, looking at uh, uh, in the archives. Uh, today, uh, it's a pleasure uh, for me to introduce a distinguished colleague of mine uh, in electrical engineering and computer sciences uh, at Berkeley, uh, Professor Eric Brewer. Uh, Professor uh, Eric Brewer uh, received his uh, undergraduate degree uh, here from uh, UC Berkeley and then obtained his uh, master and PhD from uh, MIT. And he has a distinguished uh, uh, illustrative uh, career. He's interested e essentially in all aspects of uh, internet-based uh, uh, systems. And uh, in uh, 1996, uh, he and a graduate student founded uh, Inktomi. Uh, for those of you who uh, doesn't know, Inktomi is the Google search engine at that time. Uh, it was a high-flying company. Uh, uh, Professor Brewer led it to uh, NASDAQ before it was acquired by Yahoo in 2000. Three. And uh, uh, in uh, 2000, uh, Professor Brewer also uh, worked with uh, uh, President Clinton at that time and started uh, USA.gov. This is the official portal of the United States to the world, and uh, that has become a very effective uh, tool for government to communicate uh, with the outside world. Uh, Professor Brewer is a fellow of uh, ACM, and he's a member of uh, National Academy of Engineering. And uh, today, um, Professor Brewer is going to talk about technology infrastructure for emerging uh, regions. This is a uh, technological theme of uh, Citrus, and Professor Brewer is also the theme leader uh, for these uh, 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 research uh, areas. And there's a lot of fascinating things. If you uh, like the talk, uh, I'm happy to announce that. Citrus will be sponsoring a tier workshop uh, in uh, the coming two weeks, uh, in October 17th and 18th, uh, here at UC Berkeley. There will be a two-day workshop and uh, more of the good stuff that Professor Brewer is going to uh, talk to us. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, this is a talk, variations of which I've given in, in many different countries, occasionally without power, which is harder. Um, but I haven't given it at Berkeley in a while, and this work really started five years ago with a proposal to the National Science Foundation arguing essentially that technology had a role to play in development that really wasn't being taken seriously. And I'll talk about kind of the five years since that proposal and, and what's happened. So this is kind of a natural place. It's also the reason for the tiered workshop. It's kind of the end of our original five-year NSF grant, although the work will continue. So the kind of the problem space is, is, in short version, most of the people in the world. It's not you. You have lots of people helping you. Um, but most of the people in the world do not really achieve any benefit from technology. And in some sense, what it means to be underdeveloped is to have less access to technology, broadly defined. Right? That, that is underdevelopment. So this group is mostly rural today, although urbanizing quickly, which has its own problems. Uh, it's a fast-growing group, much faster than the kind of developed world population. Like one good little note to know is that the, the best way to manage population explosion is to educate women. So in some sense, these are the places that do not have educated women and their birth rate is high, and that's why this is the fastest-growing segment. Education levels are low, uh, particularly for women, but also uh, for men. Uh, and although it's often construed as kind of a single entity, the base of the pyramid, that's a very misleading characterization because it's very heterogeneous. There is no single group that you could think of as making a product for them. There's no them. There's many, many groups. And one of the things I want you to get out of this is that the traditional view of development essentially homogenizes a bunch of things that are not homogenous. And that that's a fundamental flaw in historical development. And I think it, it's fixable. Uh, and we'll talk, in the end, I think, with some ways to fix it. So 
This traditional development model is the one you probably think of, things like the World Bank or the Asian Development Bank. And they're international. They fund big projects. Uh, it could be with political strings. In the Cold War, it was very popular to fund things like dams. And, uh, and in fact, it was arguably popular to have third world countries in debt to you, because then if you needed their vote on something, you had some pressure to apply. Uh, so there's a long history of kinds of top-down development with um, strings attached, uh, managed by the local governments. And in some sense, these governments do not represent their people. If they did, they wouldn't be in the state that they're in. Uh, so it's just somewhat fundamentally problematic to say we're going to fix the problems of the world by funneling large pools of money through a group of questionable character. But that's what we do historically. And on top of that, there's been no role for technology. I think that it's fair to say that development has really been about two things, and they're both important. One is macroeconomics, and the other is good governance. And I'm not saying those aren't important things to focus, but I'd also say that technology is the way that you're going to kind of speed up or accelerate development in these areas. There's no other way, <laughs> right? So we're going to have to have some role of technology in these regions. Uh, and that's a problem because in general, with the exception potentially of medicine and, and agricultural technology like seeds, that is a technology. Seeds are a technology. We don't usually talk about them in citrus, but they're a technology. There really isn't any technical capacity in these agencies to make good technology decisions. So one of the other things I want to get out of this kind of research endeavor is produce students, like some in the room, that can actually <coughs> help apply technology well, because that, that is missing. In general, technology is used at all. It's chosen by the contractors that implement the project, and that has its own problems because they have their own biases and they may or may not pick technologies that are most appropriate. And they're certainly not going to do technology research to create new solutions. So one of the roles we need to play is to create new solutions. One of the new solutions that has been created, although it had nothing to do with development, is the cellular phone. And some says this is the most successful technology ever, measured by impact on people, or measured by the number of users. There's nothing else that's even within a factor of 10, as far as I can tell. Um, Although this covers everyone in the developed world, it also covers you know, at least 2 billion people or so in developing regions. And in fact, that's a you know, tremendously successful technology. And even places that you think of as the most backward, you know, darkest Africa, cell phones are very popular. And in fact, Africa is the fastest growing cellular market. Right? It's still a small market, 9 or 10% penetration, but the fastest growing. So tremendously successful. We'll come back to it in a little bit. But one thing to observe is this was not done through development. There's no World Bank that said, oh, we're going to deploy a communication system to help with development. Right? It happened some other way. Right? And it turns out, I'm going to argue in part, is that this way is bottom-up demand. In aggregate, the base of the pyramid has a lot of resources, a lot of entrepreneurism, and a lot of money. Individually, they're poor, but you know, 4 billion poor people have some aggregate resources that are non-trivial. It's certainly enough to pay for 3 billion cell phones. So this demand and this bottom-up drive is part of how I think development is going to have to work going forward. And you know, this technology was not designed for these users, but it's been uh, essentially broadly taken and used and for all kinds of things. And it is different. There's, uh, for example, much more focus on prepaid cards because there's no credit system. So, in some sense, if you use cellular minutes in developing countries, because you have a, you've prepaid for all your minutes with a scratch-off card, and there is no credit, there's even not a contract. Right? So there are some differences, but bottom line is that's the technology that's been able to be kind of locally exploited in a, in a useful way. Um, another thing, to just as background to get out there, is that um, the <coughs> reasoning behind the top-down model was that development takes a lot of money and therefore it has to come from big groups. And I, I want to dispel that myth. It turns out there's plenty of money in, in kind of coming from the bottom up. The first place it comes from is what's called remittances. Uh, and this is a staggering number. Basically, every year, $40 billion, with a B, flows into Africa. Not from development agencies, but from people like you in the audience that are sending money back home. I, we, I would think in this audience it's extremely likely that, it's, that multiple people in this room send money back to their home country. Right? That flow is called remittances, and it's individually, each flow is small, 
but there's hundreds or millions or billions of those such flows, and in aggregate, they're, they're stunning. All right, so here's $40 billion that flows directly without corruption or taxation, generally. We can talk about that a little bit. There's some, some corruption and some taxation. But roughly speaking, it's a pretty good flow of money directly into the hands of people in these countries that they then spend however they like. They might spend it to eat, but they also spend it on things like wells or, or equipment, like a tractor, a shared tractor for the village, or a schoolroom house, that's a kind of classic thing, or a library for a larger city. Right? All kinds of good things that are development projects get funded through remittances, but in a way that has no agency involved. Right. It's the villagers deciding how to spend the money and what they're, and they're investing in things that, guess what, work. They work because they have local buy-in, because they're locally appropriate, because they match actual needs. So this is one flow of money that's fundamentally decentralized and bottom-up. There's another one, which is microfinance. And this one's a little bit newer, but it's uh, definitely something you should know about. Uh, it started, uh, kind of co-started in both Bolivia and Bangladesh. I'll talk about the Bangladesh side, uh, in part because Mohammed Yunus, the founder of this bank, re uh, won the Nobel Peace Prize a couple of years ago. So how does this work? Mohammed Yunus basically realized that if he loaned money to his wealthy friends, they might forget to pay him back. I think small money, 40 bucks, 20 bucks. Loan the same amount of money to his poor friends, they always paid him back. Right. Why is that? It was to his poor friends, that loan was a big deal. Right. They'd like to get another loan like that in the future, perhaps. So for them, it's a relationship that's important to maintain. For his wealthy friends, it's 20 bucks, 40 bucks, it doesn't matter. They'll, it'll even out in the end. They'll take him out to dinner sometime or whatever. Right. Same thing you would do, roughly speaking. Small loans are between friends are not a big deal. So. Uh, anyway, he kept making loans like this to his poor friends, and he realized that they were extremely reliable at paying him back. So then he said, okay, well, let's go get one of these banks to make the loans, because a bank can make a lot more loans than I can. So he did this, and of course, the banks had the predictable reaction, which is, we can't loan money to poor people. They don't have any money. They won't pay us back. These are uncollateralized loans. Right? There's no collateral for these loans. It's really, you're just trusting uh, the person. Now, it turns out there's a way we can make it more trustworthy. The bottom line is, he started his own bank, made more and more loans every year, and at this point, he's loaned something like $4 billion, but in increments of $50 to $100 to $200. So, it's an incredible number of transactions, but all small. A typical loan would be something like uh, money for a goat. You buy a goat, you milk the goat, you use the milk proceeds to pay back the loan. That kind of loan you can pay back in kind of you know, six months. Most loans like this, think of harvest season, right? You need to, if you're going to buy seeds, you would get, expect to pay back the loan when you, you, you get your crops, right? So the harvest kind of mentality is part of this loan. Anyway, so bottom line is, this is the best way we know of to get people out of, out of poverty. And to be fair, it's not a single loan. The way it works to get people out of poverty is a sequence of loans. So I loan you money for one goat, you pay it back, I'll loan you money for a second goat, a third goat. Pretty soon you have a herd and you have some employees, and now you're out of poverty. Right? And the reason the repayment rate is so high is in part because most loans go to people that have already paid back a loan in the past. Right? So the, 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 the trustworthiness comes from past behavior. That's part of it. The other reason it's trustworthy in practice is that you tend to loan uh, with two cultural constraints, which vary by country, but one of them that's broadly used is loan to women and not men. Uh, it turns out women, particularly mothers, and in some sense all women in these areas of this age are mothers, pretty much without exception unless it's medical. Uh, loaning to mothers is a good bet. Mothers invest in their kids. Loaning to men doesn't seem to have the same <laughs> behavior. And again, this was, they learned this by doing lots and lots of loans. So it's undeniable that the repayment rate for women is much higher. We can talk about why it is, but the fact remains. And of course, it's interesting because in most family structures, it's somewhat awkward for the women to get the money in a household controlled by the man. You can imagine how that would shift the power structure in the building. So there are some side effects of this that have some positive gender uh, facts, effects. Now, 
that's one cultural aspect that's interesting. The other cultural aspect that's interesting is that loans typically are made to members of a group. It could be what in India is called a self-help group. You can think of it as a group of women that take turns receiving a loan. And the reason this is good is the group is actually more stable and more reliable than the individuals. This is kind of in, uh, common in statistics in general, right? The average behavior is better than the individual behavior, right? But in places where you have a lot of disease, a lot of distraction, the outliers, the variance of an individual's ability to pay is quite high, but the variability of a group's ability to pay is, is presumably much less, presumably one over n squared <laughs> for the statistics people, right? So uh, in practice, what happens is if a woman can't make her loan payment, the other people in her group will help her out because they can't get their loan until she pays back her loan, right? So there's some peer pressure here. There's a support group aspect to this. But the bottom line is the group is quite stable and quite reliable historically to repay their loan. So what I want you to get out of this is two things. One is here is another 10 billion plus, turns out, mechanism for financing projects from the bottom up without a development agency. Right? This is actually, more, again, more money than is provided by development agencies by quite a bit. Right? Uh, and again, much more effective. There's no development project that can claim a 46% return rate in terms of getting people out of poverty. There's nothing close to that. Right? But I've just shown you two successful things, uh, cell phones and microfinance, that have brought in people out of poverty and that had nothing to do with traditional development. So one thing you want to get out of this kind of model is bottom-up businesses. Uh, that's the purpose of having bottom-up capital. So one very interesting one to learn from is take microfinance, but instead of making a loan for a goat, make a loan for a cell phone. And the repayment model is the following. I, the phone lady will rent the phone to her neighbors per minute. They pay her per minute. Then she uses the profits, because she's charging more per minute than it costs her, to pay back her loan. Right? So what's amazing about this is, is Two things. One, that this has happened 95,000 times. Right? There are 95,000 loans made to women to buy cell phones to rent to their neighbors. So the scale is vast. Right? This has led to essentially a, a tremendous amount of coverage. Right? 60 million users have used this system. And on top of that, most villages in rural Bangladesh have a cell phone now. They have phone connectivity and they didn't have it before. Right, so I want you to get to this scales. We'll talk about in a minute why it's limited to 58,000. The other thing to understand is this is a bottom-up business. It is better to be the phone lady than to be a farmer. The income is twice as high. Right, so this is a case where this kind of loan, with, which is again a totally self-supporting system because the loan is repaid, right, has doubled the income of this individual. And in addition to that, it's providing a service to the village, which essentially is that of a payphone. Unlike India, Bangladesh never really had a payphone system. So these rural villages didn't have phones largely before this. Uh, and I should say it's, it's not just a payphone. That payphone is a thing you go visit to make a call. This is a payphone that will come to you if the phone's for you, right? Because it's worth the phone lady's time to bring you the phone if someone's calling for you, right? And again, think village, so it's small town effect. The, the phone lady knows everybody in the village to first order. All right. So it's a very special cell phone. The other thing that's important about this is that because it's her income stream, she will learn whatever she needs to learn to keep the system operational. So historically, development projects, particularly the top-down ones, have had a problem which is that it's very hard to maintain the system and keep it working over time. Right? In this case, because this woman, it is her livelihood, she is you know, super motivated to keep the system up and running. And she'll do some things that will surprise you. The, the easy things are things like keeping a spare battery, or even multiple in places that have bad power where it might not be able to recharge the battery whenever she wants. Uh, learning international calling numbers and things like that, even though she might be illiterate, and those might be tricky to learn without literacy. Right? More impressive, I, I saw one phone actually in Ghana, but the same model as this, where the phone lady had connected an external GSM antenna to her phone. Now, how she knew to do this, I have no idea, right? But bottom line, <coughs> somehow she figured out that if she had this external antenna, she'd get better reception and could make more money, right? 
Don't know where that came from. But the bottom line is these are not dumb women, right? Given the opportunity and the incentive, they'll conquer a lot of problems. So that's rural income generated by <coughs> decentralized finance and decentralized entrepreneurs. Right? These are 95,000 different women that are using this. Here's another one actually based on a, a, a Wi-Fi-like <coughs> network. Uh, this is a company that does medical transcription. So they take audio uh, of a doctor doing some patient study and they convert it to text. This is the kind of thing we outsource from the U.S. to India. Well, if you're in India and you think the Indian prices are too expensive, where do you outsource it to? Rural India. Right? So this is rural India and they basically have this one, one room which is essentially a couple computers and it really is in the middle of nowhere. It's, I've, I, in fact, it's so far, I decided not to go there, which is, that's a pretty high bar for me. Um, I have students that have been to this place, because obviously we took a picture. Um, 30 kilometers from a small city, from a small city, in a kind of rural Islamic part of uh, Kerala, which is one of the southern Indian states. Um, and they basically got in the business by essentially handling this audio to text transcription for local cities and eventually they actually have now customers in big Indian cities and even some now in the US. So what's interesting about this is the income from this translation is actually again much much higher than the agricultural income of that region and um, you know even though their prices are again much lower than we would pay. Uh, so what's interesting is that the, because the labor is so low and the literacy is not great, you say how do you do translation if the literacy is low? Well, the answer is you do it three times and merge them. And so you have a, a kind of a more senior person look at the three translations. And obviously the thing that's, things that are in common are probably correct. Right? So you look at the differences, and that's what needs to be tuned up by the, the more literate senior translator. But the bottom line is this is an a extremely good little business in the middle of nowhere, totally enabled by a little bit of financing and a little bit of technology, in this case, uh, rural connectivity provided by a Wi-Fi like link. Right. So those are two examples of bottom-up businesses using technology and financing. And the, one of the things that comes out, and I'm going to cover this will tell you where I'm going, is it turns out that um, cellular, as great as it is, has essentially been an urban phenomenon. And I think people don't realize this. So it's important to bring this out explicitly. Um, in general, this is because there are base stations for cellular systems that are relatively expensive, and therefore you have to have enough users in the range of that base station to, to amortize its cost. Right? In an urban area, this is easy to do, and essentially all urban areas worldwide have cellular base stations, the first order. In a rural area, this is not easy to do, and generally speaking, rural areas do not have base stations. Right? Uh, there's a few exceptions. China's an exception because China can just dictate that there will be coverage in certain areas. Uh, the Great Wall, which is often rural, has fantastic cellular coverage. Um, it's not economically viable, but that's not the metric. <laughs> right? It's that it's important for the Great Wall to have cellular coverage. Uh, I don't actually know exactly why that is, except that maybe that it's a tourist site. But it's certainly the case that rural coverage in China is, is uniquely good. Rural U.S. coverage, by the way, if you haven't noticed, is not good. Right? It's, it's not a developing region issue, it's a rural issue. In some sense, when I say rural, you can think of it as low population density. That's what I mean, right? technically what I mean. What's interesting is that Garmin Telecom, I just told you that we have 50,000 50, villages in Bangladesh covered uh, with, this, with cellular coverage. Well, it turns out it's not an exception to this urban thing because, uh, number one, Bangladesh is a very dense country. Every part of Bangladesh pretty much has pi high population density. Uh, and the other thing that's subtle is that the base stations are not part of the, the village phone model. Right? There's no loans for base stations. There's only loans for phones. So what's really happening is that the base stations must already be there for some other reason. And that is they're subsidized essentially by the middle class users of Bangladesh. So the villages that don't have coverage are exactly those that are not in range of a base station, an existing base station. And because they're rural, they don't justify having their own base station. Right. So one way to think about this uh, is that when people argue the world is flat, 
what they're implicitly saying is the urban parts are flat. That urban Bangalore is a lot like urban Berkeley or urban Los Angeles, right? Or urban Shanghai, for that matter, or urban Accra in Ghana. But <laughs> 10 kilometers out of Bangalore in a village is totally different, right? It's not, it's not similar to, to Bangalore or Berkeley, right? So what I really think is emerging is that there's maybe a flatness to urban areas. They all have Indian food and Starbucks, right? But there's no, the divide is between the rural and the urban. And it's the rural areas, particularly from universities, that I think that need help. So all of our work is essentially now focused on rural areas for this reason. So if you want to have connectivity in rural areas, we can't use cellular. And it turns out WiMAX with its space stations will be in roughly in the same category. Might do very well in urban areas, but doesn't have much to say about rural areas. What can we do about rural areas directly? And it turns out we're going to bet on Wi-Fi, and we're going to bet on it in mostly because it's cheap. So here's the mental reasoning we went through when we started this project. We need low-cost connectivity. Wi-Fi is the lowest cost. Maybe we can get it to work, right? Um, it's open spectrum. That is very important. I'll come back to that later. Uh, and it's incremental capital cost, meaning that unlike a base station, we need a lot of money to get started. We can just put nodes down, each of which is cheap. And if we get a little more money, we can make the network a little bit bigger. Right, so cash flow is king in developing regions. Everything is a cash flow problem. Right, so you really need a network topology that can grow incrementally with incremental capital cost. Because right? that's the only way you get money. There's no, you don't really want to have to have a credit system to then prepay for some infrastructure. Right, we're going to grow it as you go. Um, but before I move on, we should point out that Wi-Fi you know Wi-Fi. It's in this room. It's used for 100 feet, 200 feet, 300 feet. It's on the surface not an appropriate choice for long distance connectivity. Right? And we'll walk through what we had to do to fix that. Um, so the, basically the research challenge is how do you get Wi-Fi to work over very long distances? Because that's not what it was made for. So this will be my, my most technical slide. Uh, this is what we actually did to Wi-Fi. And the, and the important thing I want you to understand is we made a bunch of changes to Wi-Fi, but they're all in software, meaning that we can take the regular Wi-Fi mini PCI card that's in your laptop, and we're going to make it go 100 kilometers, right, without any hardware changes. Because if we ch change the hardware, we lose the commodity leverage, all right? We lose the $5 radio, right? It's easy to make an expensive radio that go long distance, but, but we want the $5 radio to go long distance. So uh, roughly what we did is we had to go to TDMA, which basically means that the two radios are going to agree on what time it is, and then they're going to take turns talking based on time. Normally, the way Wi-Fi works is you listen. If you don't hear anything, you start talking. And that works just like you'd expect in a small area. If you're in a small area, you can hear everybody that's talking. You can use this listening protocol to decide correctly whether or not to talk. If you're far away, a, you may not be able to hear the other side very well, but you certainly can't hear what they're hearing. They may hear, hear, have a, other people talking to them that are not facing you that you can't hear. Right? So the whole concept of this basically listen then talk doesn't work at long distances and had to go. So now we're going to agree on how to talk just based on what time it is. Another problem with Wi-Fi is that Wi-Fi sends a packet and then waits for an acknowledgment. It sends a packet and waits for acknowledgment. That, again, works very well in short distances because you don't wait very long. But it turns out when you go a long distance, like 100 kilometers, the speed of light's not fast enough. It's a bummer. <laughs> it's really hard to improve. Uh, so you basically can't have one packet in the air at a time. Right? You have to essentially send a bunch of packets in this direction and then send a bunch of packets in the other direction. And to do that, we have this kind of pipeline with bulk acknowledgments. So you acknowledge all the packets that were sent to you in the other guy's turn, and you send all the packets in your turn. Did some forward error correction, which allows us to get around certain classes of noise in the system, makes us, basically gives us better effective bandwidth. And the last trick we played, which is pretty interesting, is basically uh, if we have two radios on the same pole, which is a very common setup, you'll see pictures of it in a minute, I'd really like to be able to have both of them operating at the same time in the same frequency. 
Otherwise, I have to allocate my spectrum in some clever way uh, globally. Well, it turns out, if you're a little bit clever, you say both radios transmit at the same time and both receive at the same time, then they can actually operate at the same time in the same frequency with 100% of the bandwidth for each of them. So it's just like we've magically doubled our bandwidth by allowing them to talk at the same time at the same frequency. And the reason this works, the way you should think about it, is if we're each using a megaphone, the megaphone's pointed in different directions, then the receiver who's far away can hear what I say through my megaphone, but can't hear what I say through this other megaphone pointing in a different direction. Right? And it turns out that's enough to get us double the bandwidth, or triple, or six times. If you have six radios on a pole, we can get six times the bandwidth. Eventually, they, the angle gets too small and you can hear each other and it doesn't work. But at six, it'll work. And we're still working on this. Actually, this is several students' PhD dissertations, this amount of work. Um, and there's lots of stuff going on on it. So this is a picture of throughput for 802.11b, which is the kind of the basic Wi-Fi. So four means four megabits per second. And this is distance, not in feet, but in kilometers. Right, so this, is, this gray line is what happens if you take regular Wi-Fi and you try to make it work over a very long distance. The short answer is it, it, the first part trails off because you're spending too much time waiting for the speed of light. And then this cliff here is because it turns out after a while it will just give up and say, oh, I guess the packet didn't go through. I'm going to send it again. That's called an act timeout. Uh, so I'll send it again, again, again. And then I've sent it three times without success. I'm just going to move on to the next packet. So you drop essentially by two-thirds because you send every packet three times, even though they were all getting through. It turns out they got through. It's just you didn't wait long enough to get the reply back. And then it continues off on its utilization. Uh, this is the simulated value for the new tier Wi-Fi. And then these points are actual real-world links in different places around the world. And I think we have these links in something like 10 countries now. They're not all represented here. Um, but the, the boxes are the tier real links, and the circles are the traditional real links. And you can see the circles pretty much follow that line, the squares pretty much follow the top line. Uh, that one on the end is, is pretty remarkable. That says we're getting the full bandwidth as if you were in the hotspot, right? the maximum physical bandwidth of the link, at 300 plus kilometers. Right, so one way to think about this and the way I want you to think about it is if you can see it, we can connect it at full bandwidth. We're only limited by what, how far we can see in a straight line. Because another problem we have besides the speed of light is the earth curves. <laughs> That's also hard to fix. Right, so, so the way we fixed it was by going up at 4,200 meters. So we pick a really high point. We could see around the curvature of the earth a little bit and go farther. Right. So more realistically, you should think of this as something that's good for 100 kilometers, because there aren't that many places in the world where you can see 300, 400 kilometers in a straight line. But if you can, and there are some places, then we can connect them. Right. That's the way to think about it. So using this technology, we've done a bunch of things with it. This is one interesting use. This is a kind of completely rural area in northern India around Dharamsala, which is the location of the exiled Tibetan government. And these are all villages in the Himalayas, or the foothills of the Himalayas. So pretty tough terrain, quite rural. Um, but we're supporting 10,000 users, mostly for, for VoIP calls, but actually just for internet access and email as well. So using these links to connect these villages, uh, you can actually get quite a vibrant uh, community. Some of these links are long. I think the longest one here is 41 kilometers. Most of them are short. Um, there's a several different relay points because, again, we don't have to have line of sight. And so and you can imagine in the Himalayas, it's hard to get line of sight. So typically, you go up to a relay point up on a mountain and then back down into the neighboring village. That's a typical use. But our flagship use of this has been for rural telemedicine. And just one general point I want to get across here is that I don't really want to do technology so that rural villages can watch YouTube and surf the web. Uh, there are some valuable uses to that, <laughs> but that misses the point. The point is to apply technology to the core issues of development, which are healthcare, education, good governance, commerce, things like that. So this is an example where it's, it's technically sophisticated, but the end user, what they see is going to be the doctors on TV, and I can talk to the doctor and get a diagnosis. 
right? So it's trivial to use this technology, even though it might be under, underlying have several PhD dissertations. So our partner is the Erevan Eye Hospital. They treat about 2 million patients per year, all for eye care. Uh, last year they did 285,000 cataract surgeries, which is a mind-boggling number. Um, so their specialty is essentially high volume, low cost medicine. And they found they were limited um, primarily by how far their patients were willing to walk to get to the hospital. Right? They just look at their reach and their impact. At some point, they're reaching everyone that's in the range of the hospital. And their then choice then is to build more hospitals, which they've done. They have five hospitals now. Uh, the alternative, though, is to actually try to get some rural health care directly into a, a rural vision center. And that's important because only about 7% of rural users have access to any eye care at all, meaning that the chance most people in rural areas, in India at least, are never going to get any eye care, right, period. It's just not accessible. So the hope is by putting in rural clinics that have not a doctor physically, but a doctor virtually, that those patients can get health care, at least for their eyes. So this is a, the first version we built ourselves. In fact, this network is now, I believe, 24 different village clinics. But these are the five that we built uh, to start off the project. They're all using the long-distance Wi-Fi. These are relatively short links, so you know, 15 kilometers, I think, is the longest one. That's mostly because at the time we built them, we weren't sure yet how far Wi-Fi could go, so we were conservative. Um, later links are actually quite a bit longer, but the original five are relatively short. Uh, we do get the full bandwidth on all these links, which means four to five megabits per second, even with relays, so that, you see that S node is a relay. Um, the relays can be poles on a mountain. Uh, my favorite relay is, is a chimney of a factory, so it's nice and tall. And uh, we basically uh, traded that factory internet access for power for the relay. So there's a lot of bartering in these, these areas too that's an important part of getting these things to work. Um, there's a you know, pretty simple uh, single board computer. I'll show you a picture of it. Actually, I can go back to this picture. That's it right there. It's a 30 foot pole roughly with a Linux router in a little white box with a directional antenna on top. They all pretty much look like that. So they're pointed in the direction of these links with a relay as needed to, to get around obstacles. Um, a lot of use. So a typical use would be a single room clinic. Uh, the, the equipment is essentially just the PC, the microphone and the webcam, uh, and then the slit eye lamp shown right here is kind of the only optical equipment. And we can actually do quite a bit with this stuff. We can, for example, sh send uh, vital signs or we can send images of the eye taken with this uh, slit lamp lens. We can, as JPEG, we send it over the link. Bottom line is none of that actually matters. What matters is the, is the, the high quality video for the doctor-patient interview. And the reason for that really is that these doctors are used to not having that much equipment. And so the interview is their weapon of choice. Right. It is the technique that they use super effectively for healthcare, and the, and the video is quite important for that because, as you can guess, video is a few very rich interview experience, particularly high quality video. And this is definitely TV quality. You know, good video you can do with less than a megabit, and we have four megabits. Right. So even with multiple centers sharing links, we have all the bandwidth you could need. Uh, a typical interview is about five to seven minutes. Um, usually, the way it works is patient comes in, talks with this nurse. Uh, the nurse is not a nurse in the normal kind of Western sense. She's really a village girl that's been trained in eye care quite narrowly. So she knows a lot about detecting glaucoma, but she doesn't really know anatomy. <laughs> if you have a cold, she probably can't help you any more than any other village girl, although that might still be helpful. Uh, but her training is not like a registered nurse. It's three to six months of local training uh, just in eye care on how to be this this kind of nurse. She's also the pharmacist. If the doctor says this patient needs antibiotics, she'll dispense antibiotics. Um, she's the administrator of the hospital, keeps the records, does the payments. Uh, a typical payment would be 25 cents for three visits, roughly. Uh, you prepay for three visits because they want you to come back for your follow-up. And if it's already paid for, you're more likely to come back. Right. And 20, even at 25 cents, and, and, and you know they sell glasses and do a few other things. These are profitable centers. They are not. They are not subsidized by the hospital. Um, and we can talk more about that. I don't have too much time. But um, bottom line is, this is 
tremendous impact. This is why I, started, I call it our flagship project. 80,000 patients have used the video link so far in the couple years we've had it up. Uh, they're cash flow positive, which means basically they don't cost the hospital anything to run. They probably don't easily get up the startup cost because you need a building and a PC. So it's not super clear how, what the break-even point is, but at least the, the, there's money coming in and not going out. And the most important number is this one. If you get one number from this talk, it's this one. Right? 14,000 people can see today they couldn't see before. That's a very high fraction of the 80,000 people that have used it. Right? And the fraction's that high because these are self-selected people that knew they had vision problems and hadn't had prior access to health care. Right? So it's, it's exactly that it's, it's the 7% access is what causes this number to be so high. These are mostly two kinds of things. They're either very bad refractive errors, like astigmatisms, for which normal glasses don't help, or they're cataracts, for which they need cataract surgery, which they can get for free. And that's a different story why that's free, but that's subsidized it, uh, in the same way that the Bangladesh cell phones are subsidized, that, that the paying patients are subsidizing the free patients. Um, and this number is continuing. We haven't seen a slowdown in this number. So of the 5,000 patients per month that are getting, using the system, you know, more than 10% every month are in a situation where they go from no vision to vision. Right. And I don't see that. It's going to slow down eventually if you get some of the, the, the problem solved, but it's still, still a high number at the moment. And again, for most of these centers, they haven't been operating in that village very long. The oldest ones were put in in, in early 2006, but most of them were put in in the last year. And because it's cash flow positive and impactful, the hospital can afford and wants to grow this solution. So they figured for them the right number is about 50 centers, and that'll cover about 2.5 million people in terms of the, the catch, what's called the catchment area, which is the, the size of the area that is covered by all those hospitals and villages. Um, our next step is to try to replicate this in a different environment. So, so far we've shown that we can scale it, which means, but it's different to replicate it because that means a different administrative entity, a different hospital, a different culture perhaps, although we're not going too far, we're going to Nepal and Pakistan, which are, in the big picture, culturally similar. Although, the, presumably, they would dispute that a little bit, but big picture, closer to each other than they are to, say, us or Africa. Bunch of challenges they don't have full time to go through, but I just wanted to at least bring up some of the things that we have to deal with. Um, poor quality power is one of the most interesting. This is supposed to be 220 volts. Uh, when we actually measure it, we find that it can be wildly higher or lower than that, and particularly in rural areas. Uh, this leads to a bunch of problems. The first problem is that when you have something like 1,000 volt spikes, uh, whatever's plugged into that is going to get fried. <laughs> right? So that if, it's a, if it's a Linux box or your cell phone adapter, uh, that is a problem. So that's our first problem. We've lost 50 power adapters and 30 uh, PoE's power over Ethernet ports. We use power over Ethernet to carry the power up to that radio. So when you get a bad enough spike, it'll burn the, the adapter of the PoE injector, and it'll, and it'll then burn whatever it's connected to, right? which is the Ethernet port of the receiving box. The only thing that saves us is that those boxes typically have four ports, so we get to burn four of them before we have to replace it. <laughs> um, another problem, which is, I think, in some ways worse, but certainly at least similar, is that Low voltage, which doesn't cause things to burn out, has a different problem, which is that um, things don't boot properly if the voltage is too low. So you have something booting, it comes up partially and gets stuck. And then you have to go reboot it. And I first saw this actually in about 2003 in a different center where basically every day they'd flip the literally big switch, which looks just like you'd imagine, the Frankenstein kind of switch. Uh, and that would turn on the power to the whole building. And then they'd walk around and reboot all the PCs, even though they just booted them. And it took a while to figure out what was going on. What was going on was when you turn the power on all at once, all the CRTs, which have big magnets in them and big coils, would suck all the current in. That would drop the voltage. And then all the PCs don't have enough voltage to boot properly. Uh, so then they reboot them all again after the magnets are charged in the CRTs, and then it works fine. Right? Uh, you can see why that would be difficult to debug that. Took, took a while. Um, worse than that is that our little Linux boxes, knowing that this was going to be a problem, have a second processor whose job it is to watch the first processor and reboot it if it gets stuck. 
The problem is that the second processor didn't boot correctly either. <laughs> Even though it has only one job in life, which is to boot the other processor. Um, so that's a well-known technique, the, the watchdog processor. We didn't invent it. But using it, we thought would be sufficient, and it's not. So what we en ended up doing was actually building a third watchdog to watch the watchdog, <laughs> which is an analog RC circuit that has no processor, and it's very reliable. And it's cheap. It costs about two bucks. Right, so go to analog solutions for these weird things. Uh, the other problem we had from power that's, that's worth knowing about, and again, none of these things are documented in the literature because these are not problems you have in developed countries. Right, so these are things that we discovered. I th I'm proud of discovering them, frankly, because I think they have a big impact on development. Um, this one is, the last one's interesting, which is that because the power is going up and down a lot, every time it goes up and down, there's a chance you're going to corrupt your compact flash card. Because if it was in the middle of a write, and that gets that just the wrong spike, you then corrupt that disk, and now you have to go replace that disk. And again, the game we want to play is don't visit these sites. They're hard to visit. Right? So we really don't ever want to have to go out there, and any time you lose a disk, you have to go out there. They also damage the battery, because a battery is just a big chemistry set, and if you just jar it with voltage on and off, you're going to you know, accelerate bad chemistry. Uh, and so that shortens the battery life by typically a factor of two. And that has its own problems. Uh, batteries don't have a res good recycling system in these countries, so they end up on the side of the road. Uh, if, you, if you can double the lifetime, you're having the recycling problem. Right? There's also health effects, because it turns out people are resourceful. They say, oh, here's a battery that doesn't work. I'm going to fix it. I'm going to add new acid. And some fraction of people get acid burns every year doing this. Right? It's not a safe thing to do, but you know, it's better than... That, that, that battery, half broken, is a resource. Um, what about UPS? We should be using UPS. Everything I just showed you was with the UPS in place. Uh, and the reason for this is that low-end UPSs, which are what are widely used, because again, nobody understood these issues, low-end UPSs pass the power through if it's there. So the consequence is bad power goes through the UPS and ruins your equipment. When the power's out, you have good power. <laughs> Because you're, you're running off the UPS battery. So the only time you get good power is when you're, off, when you're, when you're in an outage. Right? Totally counterintuitive. Right? Uh, and for that reason, by the way, laptops tend to do OK in these countries. Because they tend to run their power through the battery. And the battery ends up like, like a big capacitor cleaning up a bunch of the power problems. Uh, and then, of course, when you disconnect it, it's obviously running off the power. So, so the laptops have accidentally so solved this in some cases. Like the ThinkPad works great. Other laptops don't always work as well. And I, I can't say why. The main reason, of course, is they didn't design it for this. If it works, it's an accident. Um, so I'm going to move on because we're running out of time. The last technical thing I want to point out is when we started this project with the first five links, we, ended up, we did everything. We installed the links. We managed the links. Often we managed them from Berkeley. Uh, we supplied the equipment. Did everything. Right? That's not sustainable. Right? So what we have to do and what we did do is transition responsibility for the network to local resources. Right? And there's two ways we did this, and I think this is also a contribution. Uh, we, of course, trained the staff. That's easier said than done. And the reason it's hard to do is if you train the staff, you've just made them eligible for really good jobs in the city. <laughs> and they leave. <laughs> right? So training is not a one-time problem. You have to view training as an ongoing cost to the system. And everyone you train, there's a good fraction good probability that they're going to leave, and you have to view that as just a common good. Right? You've, you've improved the world by training them, move on, train the next guy. Right? So training has to be much more focused than you would expect. The other one, though, which I think is novel, is we taught a local vendor how to do the link installation. So the hospital pays the vendor to do the link installation, right? and that vendor is also a vendor that does cell phone stuff. So they, they, are, they have an existing business doing wireless stuff anyway. Training them to do this was not a big deal. So the message from this is that you have to build the ecosystem to support the project. It doesn't have to be just the hospital staff. In fact, it's more sustainable if it's not the hospital staff, than it, and it rather tries to leverage the whole ecosystem. So that's something, again, that I have not seen in other development projects yet. And in the process, they actually did a whole lot more clinics during this time. So I can now say we are not providing anything for these groups other than maybe what guidance and what equipment to use. It's run by the hospital. It's funded by the hospital. They pay the vendors to do installation. They pay the vendor $18 a year per link for maintenance on those links. It is totally self-sustaining. 
100%, on all, on all fronts as far as we can tell. Um, I'm pretty much out of time. I w do want to point out open spectrum matters, but not because open spectrum is cheap. It matters because in rural areas, carriers won't serve you. <laughs> you can't convince a carrier to provide access in an area that's not economically viable. Right, so the problem is when you use license spectrum, it's bought for the urban areas and never reaches the rural areas. So in rural areas, the license spectrum has simply not worked, again, with the exception really of China. Right. So we need open spectrum not because it's cheaper, but because it means we can actually get work done. It's a prerequisite, I think, for getting work done. And Wi-Fi in particular is the right place to focus because Wi-Fi equipment uh, is cheap, but it's also, relatively speaking, much easier to use because it was designed for consumer markets. So compared to other networking equipment, like self cellular equipment, it's considerably easier to use and more robust, and that matters in these environments. Um, I need to wrap up, which is too bad because I have lots of stuff I want to say. Um, just to repeat the decentralized view, I'll kind of summarize it up, I think that I'm not arguing that top-down development is bad. I think it just needs to be complemented by a more thoughtful, bottom-up process. Uh, and some of this has happened accidentally. We've done some ourselves, but it's not well understood. And I kind of think it's something that, that Berkeley should be leading. Uh, the financing is there. It, the, there's more financing for decentralized stuff than there is for centralized stuff. Right? It's not a money problem. It's really an understanding problem. Right? The cellular and internet are big enablers. They've enabled relatives here to communicate back home, and that's an important factor, both for, for providing money, but also for providing knowledge. There's a lot of knowledge flow in both directions enabled by these networks. And finally, the bottom-up projects, I would say, work. <laughs> they work with a much higher probability than the top-down projects. And the reason for that really is that bottom-up projects fundamentally have the, the buy-in of the people that they're for. Right? And the, all the problems are understood locally. So it doesn't matter that this kind of bottom of the pyramid is a heterogeneous group. This approach gives you heterogeneous solutions that are quite natural for each of their areas. Right? You don't have to understand the whole picture. You just have to understand this little area and how it might grow. That's exactly what we did for the eye care. So Starting very localized, solve a real problem where we can get buy-in locally. Uh, and it's not limited to IT. I think the same reasoning applies to clean water and to power. Right? There's, all those, there's lots of power projects, lots of clean water projects. Those would be better off decentralized. And there's work at Berkeley on both, but particularly Kara Nelson's done a lot of great work here on, on point of use clean water. And you can think of point of use as the water word for decentralized. Right. All right, so I'll just stop here and say we do have this workshop coming up on the 17th and 18th that's open to the public. It's really mostly for practitioners of technology in developing regions. There will be a lot of visitors worldwide because I think it's fair to say we're the leading group, at least in the U.S., in this kind of research. And so this is kind of a big event. But it's also our five-year kind of closure event on the original funding, and we'll be kind of taking a step back. But where I'd like to go is more work on the decentralized development model in general and, of course, much more work in the cellular space because it's clear that that's an important avenue. Let me stop and take questions for six minutes, and then I have to go teach class. <laughs> uh, wonderful, wonderful talk. Uh, very inspiring. Uh, questions? Um, these microloans, one would think they would have a, uh, doing a lot of microloans would involve a high amount of overhead. Are, are these banks essentially nonprofits? To these costs? Are they passed through to the borrowers, and essentially what do the borrowers pay for loans? And my second question uh, is uh, these Wi-Fi links, one would think they're kind of operating on the edge. Are they heavily weather dependent, and, or are they pretty much 100% reliable that way? Um, so on the first question, uh, microfinance loan, the loan rates uh, vary quite a bit. The, the business loan rate for microfinance loan in Bangladesh is 20% uh, per year, so it's more like a credit card in some sense. Although historically, these uncollateralized loans might have rates that are much higher than that, 50% or even 50% you know, per month, right? Uh, but these loans are typically 20%. Student loans, I believe, are, are 12%. Um, and so there is a fair amount of overhead. There's 12,000 employees at, at Grameen Bank that do these loans, most of whom are former loanees. Um, that's all taken in, in that infrastructure. These are, their, their assets have increased every year. So. Again, they've never taken any money in to build up their loan base. It's all been 
repayment of previous loans that's grown their portfolio. On your second question, are the Wi-Fi links weather dependent? The answer is no, not really. We've used them in monsoons. The only weather condition we haven't tested yet is sandstorms. I'm a little worried about that, but we've talked about trying to get across the Sahara, which is not easy. Um, we, another hard problem to solve is shorten the Sahara. Um, so that one is unknown, but for certainly, and there's lightning problems. We do have done a lot of work on how to make lightning not an issue, and I can talk about that. But uh, assume you do the, take care of the lightning issues, there's no other weather-related issues. Following up on the first question, uh, so how, how is tech, what's the link between technology and microfinance? Is there technology lowering the transaction costs and allowing these smaller loans to be more profitable? Or is it just the 20% rate of return that? Um, it, it's somewhat unclear. So the main connection in my mind originally was simply that microfinance provides financing for technology projects. Right? So it, it's a funding mechanism. But there is actually also a role which is how can technolog technology make microfinance better? And that's ongoing research, including by uh, Tapan Parikh, who's a professor here in the iSchool. Um, the short answer there is particularly that now that, that microfinance is a big deal, uh, there's reporting requirements. In, like in India, the recording requirements are actually pretty substantial. And it'd be easy to do if you had a spreadsheet. But these loan officers don't have a spreadsheet. So we're looking at using cell phones as a way to track and manage loans uh, in the field. So really a smartphone application. That will reduce transaction costs. It will also reduce fraud. Because now that microfinance has gotten to be a big deal, there's fraud on both sides. There's people, users will take a loan from one MFI institution to pay off another which is a problem. So you can just kind of circularize your debt. Uh, and the, the inverse is there have been bad agencies that really just are out to get money. <laughs> and, and it's a crime, essentially. And quick follow-up, um, is there a plan for going from micro to meso finance? Uh, you were describing the one person gets one goat, gets multiple goats, employs other people. Is that emphasized in your model to? It's neither emphasized nor de-emphasized. I think it's. Um, it would be fine. It's going to happen because there's too much capital, you know, problem we don't have at the moment. But uh, as the capital has come into these areas, there's actually need to make bigger loans because it's, it's actually the same problem the venture community has. You can't, you can't spend all your money for making small loans. Right? You can't put it to work. So uh, there will be some ways of doing bigger loans, but I think we're agnostic to it. I'm not opposed to it. I think it would be fine as long as it has an agenda that's bottom up. So I have a, one quick question here from UC Davis, and I know you need to go soon. It says, um, in one slide you showed power spikes for both, of both positive and negative voltage for AC power. Why? Um, the, my head thinks there's two potential answers to that depending on which measurements are shown in that graph, and I can't remember which they are. There are both cases, though. There are cases where the power is out of phase. In some sense, it's, it's, it, it doesn't show up correctly in terms of I mean, the way these things happen is that two of the three wires will get crossed, and, and then you'll get that's, the voltages will sum up sometimes when they shouldn't. Um, the other way it's measured is that the plus and minus don't mean anything in this case, and you can just, view, just look at the absolute value as, as the issue. And I don't remember how that data was taken, so I can't tell you which of those it is, but both, both are problems in practice. I think uh, we actually are out of time. I know you need to go teach, but... Um, okay. Let's thank uh, Professor Brewer again. Thank you. Wonderful, wonderful. This is very Berkeley project. <laughs>